Disney shares are higher after reporting earnings. The conference call is underway right now. Julia Borson joins us now with the details. Hi, Julia. Melissa, Disney CEO Bob Iger giving some insight into how the media giant plans to leverage Marvel's box office success to drive adoption of its new streaming subscription business, Disney Plus. Iger announcing that Avengers Endgame will stream exclusively on Disney Plus just a month after its launch. Take a listen. While the initial response to our DTC efforts has been gratifying, we're not taking anything for granted and we continue to leverage our creative engines across our company to ensure we deliver a strong value proposition to consumers. We're expanding into the DTC arena with tremendous excitement and optimism. As they invest in content for this new streaming business, Iger stressing the importance of their unusual strategy of putting Marvel's movie stars in shows on Disney+, Plus. also saying they're in the process of pulling back licensed content from the likes of Netflix. Now, as for the Parks Division, which is what really drove the upside surprise in the top and bottom line, Iger saying they're looking forward to the opening of Star Wars Galaxy Edge and that this quarter's numbers reflect pricing increases. We have been uh, very strategic at our approach to pricing uh, over the last a number of years, and it's really paying off. The results this quarter certainly are uh, evidence of that. And what we're trying to do basically is two things, is to price according to demand, and in managing demand, try to basically spread out attendance so that we can preserve or improve the guest experience. Iger talking a little bit about Disney's two-thirds ownership of Hulu, saying they're very bullish on the service and confirming that there has been dialogue with NBC Universal, CNBC's parent company, of course, about them possibly divesting their one-third stake. But he did say they're talking about having an ongoing relationship about keeping that NBC Universal programming at Hulu. Melissa? All right, Julia, thank you. Julia Borston joining us from Los Angeles. Guy, you know, you would think that the setup for the stock would have been a tricky one going into earnings, uh, given the uh, massive... 100%. Run in the past Huge month. run. I mean, think about where the stock was when they announced that there was going to be legalized gambling. It was a $99 stock. That was a lifeline for ESPN. Got it up 17%. And now here we are at 136. My problem with Disney isn't Disney. I like Disney. Hall of Presidents is my favorite ride, yes. followed closely by Mr. Toad's Wild it's Ride. It's not a ride. Yes, it is. But it's I'll say ride. this. It's Exhibit. a problem that I have with Disney is valuation. 21 time next year's number is just too expensive, in my opinion. This quarter was fine, but it wasn't outstanding i think you got to sell the stock here but you're okay with netflix's valuation i mean different it, company it, different company yeah, but, but i mean at some point you have to see some convergence i realize netflix and disney are in different places right now but Here's how I would go at the valuation dynamic. Disney's, Disney deserves a higher multiple, not because it's the, the, the cream of the crop in its sector, but because you want to be valuing on an EV to subscribers. And that's, you know, if you start to look at 2021, which they talked about, which at least the market's rewarded, you have to give them at least a blended multiple. Uh, and and never I just happens, think, though. It never well, happens. I, I think somewhere in here, people are starting to assess whether Netflix is too high or Disney is too low. And right now it's Disney's too I, low. I like parks in there, 25 billion in parks, that's yeah. huge. But when you look at lower royalties, lower licensing, and spending a boatload of money to pay off in some year, uh -huh. I think that it was a positioning pop that you saw here. And I think you'll see Disney settle back in. If it settles back see, in I below 120. I thought you were talking about Netflix. Oh. Right? <laughs> when, he, when he promised that, I thought that he was talking honestly, right? right? I'll tell you what, impre the same thing. what impresses me right now about Disney is the direct consumer growth just continues. And we, we talk about different parts always having to move, right? And the parks department, they've got pricing power right now. So you've got these four different businesses, and the direct consumer is something that they're absolutely focused on, right? They're looking for growth. They've got growth there. So I think they're doing everything right to the valuation point. I don't disagree with you, but I think going forward, if they continue to grow their earnings the way they have, then I think they actually can grow into those earnings. I think they are a little bit, I think this run has been great, and I've been saying all for the last couple of weeks, 170 price target that I've seen a couple of people out there, that seems too high. That seems way too high for me in terms of where they are right now over the next year. No way. But I do think there's upside yet in Disney. All right. We need to bring in the man who wrote the book on Disney, I think. Did he write a book? Time. Yeah. Mean, yeah, literally. Let's bring book. in New York Times columnist <laughs> and CNBC contributor Jim Stewart. Jim, it's always great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, nice to be here. Is Disney at this point show me? I mean, does it have to show its I, DTC product? It does it have to show that subscribers will come? Does it have to show that it could pull it off? Well, you know, obviously at some point it has to deliver, but that. that Point, maybe some point in the future. I think what we're seeing here is a multiple expansion. It is a little bit of what you're saying about getting the halo of the Netflix phenomenon. I mean, 
Bob Iger, to my view, has done a brilliant job of changing the whole conversation from this being a legacy media company saddled with potential losses at ESPN to being a high-tech Netflix kind of company. And that, you know, Investor Day a couple weeks ago, talk about show me, they, that, you know, that dazzled people. They got a big run on the stock after that. I think at that point, a lot of people came, became believers in the direct-to-consumer thing. The earnings today, I mean, every surprise for me was positive that uh, the cable networks were up, that they're stable, that ESPN is not collapsing, and the losses in direct consumer were really modest. You know, they, they're, you know, they increased ESPN Plus quite a bit. It's still only two million, it's not a huge number, but they're getting a nice cash cushion there. And then, you know, the park's doing very well, which is, you know, I think a reflect, reflection of consumer confidence. And then we know they've got the Avengers cash coming down the pipeline so that didn't really show up in the movies yet, but that's you know a very positive thing coming along. They've got a, a lot of cash here to work with. Yeah, they're going to need a lot of cash, though. I they mean, are. in order to be in this arms race of content against the likes of a Netflix, it's got to be prepared to spend all that money. How do you sort of think through, especially for the Disney shareholder base currently, they're probably not used to those enormous tabs that Disney's going to have to spend in order to compete on content. Well, I think the big question is not just for Disney, but for everybody in here is, is the streaming model ever going to really deliver the kind of profits that the legacy businesses did? And I think the jury is out on that. I mean, I think the, the theory is it's kind of Amazon-like that someday you're going to get a world where there are very few players that dominate streaming and then they'll have pricing power. and they can really start raising prices and you know it'll all be you know profit rolling in but when is that day i mean amazon is starting to make money but it's been 20 or more years um, they're still trying to conquer the market how long will this battle for the streaming market go on i mean i think disney will be a survivor some and someday will have some pricing power there but it's going to be a long battle so one of the concerns for Disney over the last couple of years is who is what's the succession plan? Is Bob Iger now the succession plan for Bob? Does he have to stay now, given everything you just said? <laughs> well, it, you know, I, when I wrote my book, it was Eisner. You know, Eisner would pick a successor, and then the, you knew that the end was near. Um, I don't want to say that Bob Iger is repeating the pattern, but we have seen some very, you know, promising people come up, and, you know, Tom Staggs being the most recent example, and then suddenly they disappear. I'm sure he's got some, he's grooming some people now. I, I do think at some point he wants to, to step step aside when he gets over some of these big challenges. And you know he could go out now as a hero. I, I mean, a lot of people, including the Disney family, have been criticizing his pay. I will say, I think Bob Iger has earned that pay lately. I mean, look at the the stock price, and a lot of that has been his ability to change the conversation and to inflate that multiple. And I, I, I give him a huge amount of credit for that. If I was Bob Iger, I don't want to stay forever. And I don't want to stay if things are going to like go bad. So, I mean, he could leave now as a hero. James, does Disney get too much credit for being the content machine? I mean, because, you know, if you look at and, and Tom Rogers, who's on our show a bunch of times and, and is a contributor and knows a lot about this story, too, pointed out that ABC and Disney Channel are in shambles. Um, they crank out a few good movies, but are they really making great content across the board? Well, I think, you know, they're not going to have a hit with every single thing. Um, they have been very strategic where they put their big investments. They have the franchise products have just been amazing. And again, I, I think Avengers, people say, oh, well, it's just these Marvel characters. But they have put these together in a uniquely creative way. That guy, Kevin Feige, he deserves every penny of whatever bonus he's getting. They have executed with their intellectual property, I think, at a consistently very, very high level. And it's given them the resources. I'd like to see them, frankly, take some more chances. Mm. You know, people say, oh, well, Dumbo wasn't so great. It's just, you know, a remake. But, That's what you said, um, guy, right? I loved it, though. Yeah. Michael Keaton's fantastic. Well, Sorry. I say good for them. You know, it's fine. <laughs> you know, you, I think it's great for Hollywood. These studios need to have some misses to have the great hits. Right. So it's unrealistic. It's like oil drilling. You're not going to hit a gusher with every single one. And they need to take some risks. I'd like I'd like to see Disney, frankly, take a few more risks. They've got the money to do it. Jim, always great to see you. Thank you so much. Sure. James Stewart of the New York Times. Grasso. So the only direct streaming play that we have here is Netflix. It's up 36% year to date. So Disney's up 23%. It's had a, a, an unbelievable run. How do you play all of it? Roku, after the bell, up 7%, 8%. It will stand to benefit from all these, but it's up 111%. So you got to wait here. You almost got to miss the first 5% up higher from here. 
to break through resistance before you put new money to work in Roku.